Hi again. Arthur Benjamin here with my partner, Sarah White, and we're here with a very exciting show today. You all probably know a, an organization here in Dallas, the SPCA, Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. That's the one that Bandit keeps calling 311 and reporting me <laughs> with those false reports. Um, and uh, we're here uh, to talk with them today. Absolutely. And I actually have to read you some numbers because they're so impressive and there's so many of them. So in 2010, the SPCA of Texas admitted 8,280 animals. They adopted out 5,408 animals and they actually helped over 16,000 animals get spayed or neutered. So great, great job. And here to tell us more about what the SPCA of Texas does is the president, James Bias, along with Lacey Ball. So welcome, you guys. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Absolutely. So proud to have you here. And I think the important thing is to point out that those numbers don't reflect the 88% live return rate that you have for dogs and cats, which is an incredible number. That's correct. That's, in that's a total all species animal. So we take livestock, we take fighting roosters, and so that, that 8,000 count is, is a much larger number not just dogs and cats, and, but we do have a live release rate that's about 88% right now. Um, the SPCA of Texas here in Dallas actually changed our intake policy several years ago to where we only accommodate pets into our shelter that we have space for. So we don't euthanize animals based on a number of days or, or that the municipal shelters usually have to face. Well, that's great. Yeah, because it's always a, a concern. Is you don't, you know, want to... If you find an animal, or I think people don't really know what to do, and there's the whole hesitancy of if you take it somewhere, is it, you know, are its days numbered sure. by, by taking it there? So, And that is a concern for a lot of folks when they do bring uh, a pet to the SPCA or considering having to give up a pet. They, they want to feel assured that the animals aren't going to be up against a timeline. And so for almost seven years now, we've had that policy in place where there is no timeline. Mm -hmm. We call it a reservation required policy, so we always encourage folks to go ahead and call in, make an appointment to make sure that we have the adequate space, especially if it's a special situation like the animal may need to go to a foster home, something like that, before it's able to be put up in our adoption program. So those are special things that we're able to do to kind of go the extra mile for our pets. So do you have a waiting time on a normal basis, or is there usually space? Well, we have people call in daily because our... our population in the shelter, and we operate two shelters, one up in McKinney in Collin County, and then one in Dallas, and that population changes every day with the number of animals being adopted. That's going to create openings for folks that have to give up their pets to be able to get them into the SPCA. So we take reservations on a daily basis, and as Lacey mentioned, uh, if we can accommodate those pets, then we can bring them in. And then they go through the whole rehoming process, getting them vaccinated. Uh, spayed or neutered, which is critical, and it's also the state law, and then putting up for adoption and looking for the, the right kind of family. What about chipping? Do, do, do your dogs and cats leave with chips? All of our pets have a microchip in them, so they do have permanent identification. Uh, we also include a pet health insurance policy for the first month after adoption. Uh, we have a list of veterinarians that they can go to after adoption, so if there are medical issues post-adoption, they can go in and have treatment uh, taking care of her common ailments. Mm -hmm. We even actually have a heartworm test for dogs. Everybody who's six months and older gets a heartworm test for your dog. We also have a feline leukemia test for cats. So mm. we try to cover all of our bases. And of course, we do adopt out heartworm positive dogs as well. So for those special needs pets, we have a wonderful program or partnership with BCA Animal Hospitals where our adopters can get that done for free. And well, Copper is a lap dog? You know, Copper <laughs> is, is, he wants to be a lap dog, but at... Uh, Close to 95 pounds, he, he's, he pretty much stays on the floor. Uh, <laughs> Copper is actually an adoption alumni from the SPCA, mm -hmm. and he came to the SPCA in several different ways. He was, his mother was transferred to the SPCA from another shelter. Um, he was from a litter of nine, so somebody did not control the population by having their pet uh, spayed. So Copper's mother came into the SPCA, went through our foster program until the puppies were old enough. He and his eight siblings then were put up for adoption, and then one of my kids said, Dad, we need another dog. And so Copper's been in our family now about four years, and uh, 
this is his first time being on television, so he's oh. uh, thrilled and a little nervous, too. Well, your family population is almost as large as the SPCA's population. <laughs> you know, some people have said, you know, we have animal hoarding, and somebody even said we have kid hoarding going on in the Bias household. But uh, he, uh, uh, Arthur's been teaching him how to shake today, Look and so now he's trying to get uh, Arthur's attention. That's funny. Oh, now. copper. <laughs> now, how important is education for the SPCA? Well, do you want to talk about some of the education programs? Sure, absolutely, programs we yes. Have? We actually do have an entire department that is ed dedicated to education. We go out and we are able to educate many schools at, within the Dallas-Fort Worth uh, Metroplex. And actually our humane educator, Michelle, she actually will go in and we start with the little ones. We, we really love to go into those elementary schools. We, we get to teach them about animal cruelty, ways to get involved in your own community, how to look for animal cruelty, how to report it. So we're getting kids, you know, between, I mean, kindergarten all the way up to fifth and sixth grade. Mm -hmm. So that's really going to make an impact for it. And we also love it when they are able to come to our critter camps. We actually have two critter camps this summer. We're having one in our Dallas shelter and also in McKinney. And we also have what's called a spring break camp. So they get to do all kinds of great stuff. They get to watch a spay or neuter surgery. They get to talk to our veterinarians. They get to learn all about medicine, the way that we run things here at the SPCA of Texas. They also get to talk to our humane investigators with our rescue investigations team. So it's a really inf informative, but also fun and creative way for your kids to spend their summers. So education, we love to, like I said, start out young, you know, instill those values that are so important to the community and, and really hopefully make an impact. How long is Critter Camp? We actually have, I believe, eight sessions this summer, and uh, it's a, about a half day. It's f between 11 and 3. So we need to it's a good chunk of the day. Oh, that would be fun to go to. We, we, have and we to still have some spaces open. So I haven't seen you can visit surgeries. our website. It's www.spca.org, and definitely register your kids. When you Go ahead. I'm sorry. You mentioned uh, animal yeah. cruelty and animal investigation of cruelty. Uh, so if somebody calls, I was joking about bandit, but if somebody calls yeah. 311 in the Dallas area, mm -hmm. what happens? People want to know. And how do you get involved? Well, the SPCA of Texas, as a private nonprofit organization, doesn't have the government authority to go out and remove animals from homes or arrest people. But we are um, uh, a support mechanism for law enforcement. All of our cruelty investigators are commissioned peace officers with other law enforcement agencies but they wear the SPCA uh, outfit. And then they come in and support law enforcement, the court systems, uh, the DA's office, to take those animals out of harm's way, go through a custody hearing. Uh, we'll house those animals during the custody hearing if an animal does need to be removed. Uh, if there are criminal charges, we'll be able to provide expert testimony from veterinarians and cruelty investigators to uh, give the court system all that they need to have uh, their day in court to watch out for these animals. They don't have the ability to pick up the phone and dial 911 or 311. Some might be able to text, like your dog, you know, might be able to send a text in. But, um, you know, they really depend on people to, to call in those complaints, and the SPCA is that safety net for uh, these, these poor animals. Well, you know, I, I work with an organization called Toss of Vets, and we actually have some dogs that dial 911. In emergencies, so it's a, it's a it's a tr it's something they can be trained to do. Yeah. Um, but uh, you also work in combination with other other organizations. I know, like uh, uh, the Humane Society of the United States, of which you serve on one of the advisory boards, and I serve on the National Council. It, for example, uh, I don't know how many people know that in the Kaufman raid, where 500 and some odd animals were uh, taken away due to animal cruelty. You took how many of them? About 250 of them. So you so. took half of the animals that were in the local area that needed a home. And most people don't realize this, but each Humane Society and each SPCA locally is a, is a standalone nonprofit organization. So there is no chapter or branch. So the SPCA of Texas was known as Dallas SPCA, but because we're in, in Collin County, we used to be up in Denton County, and our cruelty investigators go through several counties. We changed our name a few years ago. but. Uh, so the Humane Society of the United States really doesn't have a governance role with the local Humane Society. The ASPCA in New York doesn't have any type of connection to us structurally, but we all partner together. So when the HSUS comes in and removes animals from a, a cruelty case, they'll quite often look for the local organizations who operate the shelters to take those animals and try to find a home for them. And so we, we all stay in communication and work 
uh, together to, to take care of all these poor animals. Now, can we talk about uh, your campaign against puppy mills? Certainly can, and, and there are a couple of things that have gone on in the state of Texas over the last uh, few years. One is uh, a, a generous grant that came to the SPCA through the Reese Jones Foundation mm -hmm. to go in and educate law enforcement agencies, uh, educate the community in, uh, that's looking to purchase an animal from a puppy mill that we know that most people do not want to buy a puppy from a puppy mill, but they don't know what a puppy mill looks like. Right. The, the, the little old lady in the uh, parking lot that has the, the, the wire cage with some puppies, you know, they'll just say it's an unplanned litter, they're trying to make a few dollars, when in fact it's connected to a large operation in another county with hundreds of animals that are left in cages. And so the first part of our, our campaign was educating the community to, to look out for certain signs when somebody won't let you come to their house and take a look at where those, those puppies are coming from. Mm -hmm. If they're very elusive and, and they can create websites that look fantastic, Absolutely. but those websites uh, don't give an indication of what's really going on. Then again, working with law enforcement, working with the courts. Um, and so we started this campaign last year. Uh, we call it Know the Truth Behind the Cute. Uh, we've had billboards, uh, radio and television time out there to educate the community. And then certainly working with uh, complaints as they come through to the SPCA. You know, the hardest thing is to look at a little cute puppy, a dog that's three to five pounds that's going to grow up to be a copper, copper. Mm -hmm. but to really know behind that, that when you're buying from someone and the dog is coming from a puppy mill, that that puppy's mother is in a wire cage for their entire life. Mm -hmm and they may never put their feet on ground. They may just be on a wire, bottom of a wire cage. And that's the reason not to buy, unless you know the source of the dog. Most definitely. And you know, the other thing that's been going on in Texas is starting, uh, trying to create a licensing program. And, and I think you all have featured in past episodes about those efforts and how they've been watered down through heavy lobbying by the puppy mill industry who feel convinced that, you know, their way is the right way, which is housing these poor breeding animals in an area that's just barely big enough for them to stand up in difficulty even turn around. And so we recognize that our cruelty laws are, need to still be enforced. But the more proactive side is if people aren't buying, mm -hmm. they're not going to breed, they're Supply not going to sell. Demand. That's yeah. right. I'm so glad that you mentioned that about the mothers because that's really one of the most important things that people can look at always ask to see the parents of any puppy that you're going to buy, especially if you're looking for breeders. Responsible breeders will be the first ones to invite you to where the puppies are, meet the parents, they'll tell you all about the bloodlines, typically they'll do a wellness exam. You can tell that they have gone above and beyond to make sure that all of the puppies in their care are extremely healthy and that the parents are very happy. They will not breed and breed and breed every single time the mom goes into a heat cycle. And that is, in my opinion, one of the saddest things is to see the moms who have given birth to these puppies. I remember one, we actually, the, the puppy mill campaign that James was talking about in the commercial, the puppy is actually from a puppy mill. And you'll also see her mom featured. And one of our amazing foster families, Marianne Brown, she was the foster mom for Emmy, who is the mom. And she mentioned to me, it was as if Emmy had never even felt grass before. She was three years old. She had to learn to walk. It was, it was incredible and something that I have never seen before working here. So it is extremely an extremely cruel practice, and that's really what we want to educate the public about. That's a great lead-in. It is. Let's take a look at that. Let's look at that PSA that we have right now. Every year, families in North Texas unknowingly spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in support of neglect, abuse, and disease. When you buy a puppy from a parking lot or flea market, you could be supporting the cruelty of puppy mills that profit from dogs bred in abusive conditions. Puppy mills thrive on deception. 
they hide the harsh reality. So a cute puppy is all you see. Help us stop the cycle. To learn how, go to spca.org slash no puppy mills and take the puppy pledge. Well, she yeah. did it again. Yeah. Well, and it's a very <laughs> powerful message. Um, the uh, marketing arm, which is a company here in Dallas, worked with the SPCA, took us on as a pro bono client, and what w they discovered through their research, again, is if we let people know where these animals um, are coming from in a puppy mill, they will not buy. And this re reverse timeline that they came up with, I've seen it over and over again, and it still impacts me, and I know it's impacting mm -hmm. the two of y'all. It, it resonates with everybody that has seen this, whether they care about animals or not. Uh, the, the, the little puppy featured in here, is, as Lacey mentioned, and her mother, which was in that wire cage, mm -hmm. and that was all kind of makeup. That was not waste Some and, and everything. Some caked on, there. not feces. <laughs> sure. But it, it, it really connects the dots for people and, and lets them know, you know, that poor mama dog for three years was in that, that wire cage. And that little puppy, you know, again, the buyer had, would have no idea. Sure. And, um, you know, we're going to continue to message that out and let people know. Um, and we appreciate you all allowing us to share it today and getting that message out as well. Oh, it's so important. And you know what's yeah. so funny? I mean, we do this, right? We do um, some TV and different things. I actually know the lady, the actress that was playing. Do you? The Puppy Mill. Yeah, yeah I mean, I she's love She's out of her. the Austin she's area. Wonderful. I think she came yeah, in from Austin. She's amazing. And she is one of the biggest animal lovers you'll oh, ever meet. So absolutely. Like, so, I hate this role. But even still, like, it still just punches you in the gut. And so it's one of those unnecessary, I'm sorry necessary unpleasantries mm -hmm. to get to see that and for people to really know because they don't and you do you get so caught up in the cuteness of this sweet little mm -hmm. innocent puppy mm -hmm. that yeah. it truly is just a shame yeah. so yeah. anything we can do to help uncover that and you know eventually make those go away we thank you we'll there's, certainly do there's a little female maltese puppy in new york city that um was one of the mamas th from one of the hsus raids and I was at the dinner in New York, and I got up on stage, and they told me I couldn't raise money. So I got up and took this little puppy, that puppy, mama dog, but two pounds, named Snowy. And I got up on stage and said, you know, I can't raise money, so I'm going to raise a home for this dog. Dog's name Cinderella, lives on Park Avenue, has a chauffeur. Wow. And is walked like five times a day. But it's, it had, had to have 18... To, uh, somewhere around 18 operations and it's a very lucky dog but there are thousands that spend their whole lives in cages mm -hmm. and die in those cages mm -hmm. and they live in feces and uh, it's just not good yes. when it's really unfortunate because we know that only about a, a quarter of the dogs that are in people's homes come from shelters the other 75 percent are purchased from pet stores and and puppy mills backyard breeders and, you know, one, it doesn't make sense to, you know, if you're looking to add a new dog or cat to your family, to go to your local animal shelter and give them a second chance at, at a wonderful life. But if you do find that you need to purchase, a, you know, a particular breed type, go through the breed rescue groups first. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then if you are looking through the breeder, know who you're buying from. We need to put these people out of business. Mm -hmm. Enforcement on the cruelty side is way after a lot of abuses happen, and the SPCA will be there to work with law enforcement to go after these folks criminally. But we need to just dry up the, the, the need for people wanting to buy these animals. So let's talk about the big fix in Big D, well, so that we don't lose that one in this time. Well, and, and to change gears a little bit, we, we certainly are dealing with a pet explosion across the country. Dallas is no exception, and we know that the city shelter will take in over 30,000 dogs and cats uh, this year. And again, it's, it's starting to come down a little bit, but still it's 30,000 unwanted animals. Many are litters of puppies and kittens. And so we are fortunate enough that the SPCA of Texas, working with the City of Dallas Animal Shelter, Metroplex Animal Coalition, Kaufman County Animal Awareness Project, are all coming together to perform we're hoping close to 60,000 spays and neuters in the Dallas, city of Dallas over the next three years. 
and it's being funded by a group of, of local foundations who feel enough need, you know, needs to be done for these animals. And so the SPCA, along with the rest of these, for $20, will be doing spays and neuters and all the vaccinations. So it's a $20 copay. It's focused on 18 zip codes. Most of those are south of Interstate 30 in the city limits of Dallas. And so this is a pilot So program. how much does it actually cost to do that? Are you doing it based on a, a, a grant or a donation contribution? Right. I mean, the organization's hard cost to do these surgeries can range between $50 to $200, depending on the size of the pet. So we're getting a subsidy from uh, these foundations to help cover that hard cost. And so we're asking that the, the pet owner That's just great. come up with $20, and that'll cover the total cost of the surgery and all the vaccinations. So they can do the right thing health-wise for the community, protect them against rabies, but also avoid the, the issue of another unwanted litter, like Copper here came from a family who didn't get the, the, the mother dog fixed, and as a result, nine puppies were brought into, into this world. And probably Cop more than that. Exactly. Too. Yeah, we have no idea. And, She's now spayed in a, a great home. All of Copper's litter mates were spayed or neutered. And we're really thrilled that there's just this energy going on in the city of Dallas now. Well, and I got to tell you, you guys are a huge part of that. And we are so thankful that you were on the show today. Uh, the SPCA of Texas can always use your help, always. So if you want to donate, call 214-461-1814 or go to their website, www.spca.org. Copper. Hey, Copper. He's asleep. They need your help. <laughs> Y'all are boring. We'll be back. <laughs> <No>. <laughs>
His mother was there, so was the rest of his family, and so was his dog that had traveled so far. We go out for physical training and she'd go run with us. She'd stay in formations with us. She was very important. She was very important to everybody because uh, in places like that, you don't really have very much. And uh, having a puppy was like having a part uh, of our homeland with us there. He says he's happy to be home and happy she's home too. Steve Osinzami, ABC News, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. You know, uh, that was Fort Campbell and dear friend and a great congressman, Ed Whitfield, uh, is from that area. And uh, the dogs that we brought back from Afghanistan, the 14 dogs, you know, they are like the dog that you saw me on CNN with, Tazzy, who is now serving a soldier. These are feral Afghan dogs that are friends of our soldiers, but they too can come back and become service animals. And if not, great companion animals for guys and gals that have come through the worst over there. Well, and that was so special that they actually were able to bring that, that puppy back and reunite him. Um, that was really sweet. And that's one of those things that you, you know, when he says, when he said, you know, there's not much over there, so a puppy was, you know, everything. Um, I'm, I'm sure that holds true for, for a lot of people over there and a lot of people here. You know, that companionship and that unconditional love that you can get from an animal. Um, uh, there's a great picture of a soldier with a full backpack on and the little pouch on the side with like a three pound puppy in it. And he's marching home 40 miles from some battle somewhere. And what he took home, the only thing he had to show for that battle and for everything he had been through was to have saved a life. Of that puppy. So, I, I mean, I imagine that gets him through some some long nights. The ones yeah. I've talked to who I've spent a lot of time with the um, soldiers coming back and they say that it is what gets them through the nights and what it gets them through the hypervigilance that they all live with that they can actually let their guard, guard down. Mm -hmm. If someone walks up behind me, Bandit will alert me that there's someone there. And that's the first time you can really relax because you've spent 24-7 watching all around you, and now you can transfer that to an animal. Let the animal watch, and you can relax for the first time. See, that's amazing. That yeah, is it is amazing. truly amazing. Well, and I think it helps just tie into, you know, service animals and, you know, pause, pause for vets and pause for all of the, the prisons Pilots and such and organizations. Pilots and Paws does a great job, and mm -hmm. we were so fortunate today to have such great guests. Absolutely. Yes, thanks. Big thanks to uh, James Bias and Lacey Bell for joining us. And copper. Uh, from, the, from the SPCA. Absolutely. Well, and we didn't even get to talk about their new facility there. Uh, I'm going to go see it. Yeah, yeah, I heard that. And we'll go to camp, Critter Camp. Okay, I would love to go to Critter Camp. Oops. So for more information, you know, you can always find out more about For the Love of Dogs at AmericanDogRescue.org. You can follow our shows. You can see our upcoming guests. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. And we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.